A routing protocol makes routing decisions based on the information available to it. For example, EIGRP looks at bandwidth and delay. OSPF looks at costs. So logically, it follows that in order to influence a routing protocol to change its routing decisions, we must change the information that the routing protocol considers. There are two ways we can do this. We can add information. For example, we can advertise a summary route or a default route to a neighboring router, or we can remove information. For example, we can use a distribute list to block an EIGRP advertisement, or we can use a route map and prefix list to deny certain prefixes from being redistributed. As we look at the next customer request, I want you to think about ways that we can either add or remove information in order to achieve the desired result. R1's loopback 1.1.1.1 takes the following path to 5555. R2 to R3 to R4 to R5, okay? Modify existing dynamic routing protocols as necessary so that traffic takes the following path. ISP1 to R4 to R3 to R6 to R5. Okay, let's take a look at the topology diagram. Now, the current path is from R1 to R2 to R3 to R4 to R5. The customer wants the path to be from R1 to ISP1 to R4 to R3 to R6 to R5, which admittedly seems pretty crazy, but there could be a perfectly valid reason for routing traffic this way. Keep in mind that path control is about controlling the per hop forwarding decisions made by each router, so we need to approach this by going to each router individually and making the necessary changes to ensure that it forwards the packet to the next hop as specified by the customer. So of course, we're gonna start at the source of the traffic, R1. The first thing we're going to do on R1 is verify the current path that R1 is taking. Let's just do a trace route 5555 source 1111. And we see that it's going from 2 to 3 to 4 to 5. Okay, so now let's do a show IP route 5555. And we see that it's learning this route from R2 via OSPF. Okay. Now, let's see if we are also learning anything about this 5555 prefix from ISP1. Let's do a show IP BGB 5555 slash 32, and it says the network is not in table. So we're not learning anything about this prefix from ISP1. All right, let's go to R4. Now here, let's do a show IP route 5555. Okay, so we see that R4 is advertising this prefix into BGP. So ISP1 knows about that prefix. Now what this means is that we can go back to R1, create a static route pointing to ISP1, and then we can block the more specific OSPF route. Let's go back to R1, and let's go ahead and do a router OSPF1 here, and we'll start out by blocking that 5555 prefix from OSPF. We'll do a distribute list, route map and we'll just call this rm no 5555 and it's going to be an inbound distribute list because in ospf you cannot block outbound advertisements but you can block inbound advertisements from being installed in the ip routing table so that's what we're going to do with this next we need to create the route map route dash map rm underscore no 5555 and we want to make this a deny here and we're just going to match IP address prefix list, and then we'll create a prefix list called PL underscore 5555. IP prefix dash list PL underscore 5555 permit 5555 slash 32. All right, cool. Now let's go ahead and do a show IP route 5555. And it's gone, network not in table. Cool, so we're blocking that prefix from getting installed on the IP routing table. Now, what we need to do is, we need to ensure that R1 uses ISP1 as the next hop here. So we're gonna go ahead and just do a static route. We're gonna make this a default route pointing to ISP1's interface. All right, now let's do a ping 5555 with a source of 1111, and it works. Cool. Now let's do a trace route, 5555, source 1111, and now 
it goes from ISP1 to R4, which may not be quite obvious because that second hop, that 198.51.100.1, that's actually R4's interface IP, which is facing ISP1. And then from there, it goes to R5. The customer wants the traffic to go from ISP1 to R4 to R3 to R6 to R5. So now that we're getting the packet all the way to R4, we need to get R4 to send that packet to R3. All right, so let's go back to R4. Let's do a show IP route 5555 again, and we see that it's learned from R5 via EIGRP. Now, you might be thinking, well, hey, let's just block the advertisement from R5 so that R4 will prefer the other path, which is through R3. But in order to do that, R3 has to advertise that 5555 prefix via OSPF. Is it currently doing that? Well, let's do a show IP OSPF dat, and let's look for that 5555 prefix. And if I scroll down here, I see the one from R4, but I don't see anything from R3. So why is R3 not advertising that prefix? Because remember, R3 is redistributing from EIGRP into OSPF. That's one of our redistribution points. So why is it not redistributing this prefix? Well, it's simply because R4 is redistributing the prefix into OSPF with a lower metric. R3 doesn't even create the type 7 LSA for the prefix because there's no reason to. As long as R4 is redistributing the prefix as a type 7 LSA, R3 is not going to, okay? So we have two options here. We can either filter the EIGRP advertisement using a distribute list, or we can modify the administrative distance of that prefix on R4. Now, personally, I would opt to change the administrative distance because filtering the route altogether means that we eliminate redundancy. So let's go ahead and do that. We'll just change the administrative distance for this prefix. We'll do router EIGRP 10, and we'll use the distance command. We'll make it 111 so that it's less preferred than OSPF. Now, I'm gonna do something a little strange here. I'm gonna put 10045 as the source address. The wildcard mask is gonna be all zeros. And if I hit another question mark here, it's asking me for an access list. So I'm going to put 45. Now, what this is going to do is this is going to apply the ACL 45 as a filter to routing updates received from R5. That's that 10.0.45.5. That's R5. We need to create an ACL with the 5555 prefix in it. We'll just do access list 45, and we want to permit... 555500000. And the reason we're permitting this is because we want to change the distance just for this prefix. We'll go ahead and hit enter here. Now let's do a show IP route 5555. And we see the prefix is now learned from R3. All right, so this is good. Let's go back to R1 and run that trace route again. Do trace 5555 source 1111. We see that it goes from R1 to ISP1 to R4 to R3 to R6 to R5, which is exactly the path the customer requested. So we're done. We perform several configuration tasks in this clip, so let's briefly go back over what we did and why. R1 was learning the 5555 prefix from R2, so the first thing we did was create a distribute list to block that prefix from being installed in R1's IP routing table. Now, since this removed that prefix from the IP routing table, we needed a way to drive traffic for that prefix towards ISP1, so we created a static default route pointing to ISP1 as the next hop. Now, ISP1 learned about that prefix from R4, so it forwarded the packet to R4. R4 was learning the prefix from R5 via EIGRP, but not via OSPF. Since R4 was redistributing the prefix into OSPF, thus creating a Type 7 LSA, R3 did not redistribute a Type 7 LSA into Area 34, that NSSA area. Because R4 was still learning the prefix from EIGRP with a lower administrative distance, it was still preferring that path directly to R5. So next, we modified the administrative distance for the 5555 EIGRP route to be 111, which is greater than OSPF's administrative distance of 110. 
This caused R4 to stop redistributing the prefix into area 34, which in turn allowed R3 to start redistributing that 5555 prefix into area 34 by creating its own type 7 LSA. Now this in turn caused R4 to route traffic for the prefix to R3, and at that point there was only one possible path to get to R5. 